Welcome to the Difficult Airway Pathway Education Module number six. This is our last module in our series, and this specifically involves looking at the NHS Difficult Airway Pathway for our pediatric population. As always, you can send your questions to shira.starfish at gmail.com or contact any of the members of the committee. So, what about our pediatric population for our Niagara Health system. Well, we applied the same rigorous process. We used the same committee, except for we had separate representation from our pediatric colleagues. When that uh, committee met, they looked at experts within the pediatric community to come up with a pathway that would be appropriate for our uh, patient population, following the same uh, goals and objectives as our adult population. They essentially came to a consensus that they were going to use the same ABCD pathway as the adult population, with the exception that the emergency surgical airway access recommendation for children is jet ventilation. Also, we have located all of the equipment for our pathway in the code pink cart, uh, along with the Braslow tape. So all of the equipment that you need is uh, located there, clearly labeled out also for our A, Bs, and Cs. Um, the only exception is that our jet ventilator is located on the adult cart in the same uh, drawer D, which corresp corresponds to our uh, surgical airway. Our uh, algorithm for the pediatric patient. As you can see, it covers all of the same key elements that we use in our adult population, including plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. Essentially, we are following the same elements, direct, video laryngoscopy, direct or video laryngoscopy, confirmation of endotracheal intubation. If we fail that, we declare failed intubation, we move on to plan B, where our primary focus is oxygenating our patient. We're trying to do this through a supraglottic airway device. If we are successful, we have to stop and think about what type of immediate airway management is required. Is it definitive? And if it is, what type of expert help can we use? Do we need to intubate through the supraglottic airway device? Do we need to do a tracheostomy? If we fail to oxygenate our patient with a supraglottic airway device, we're going to go on to plan C, which is our uh, last attempt at oxygenating our patient, giving paralysis if we haven't done so already, and preparing for. Front, front of neck access and plan D. At that point, the one difference between adults and pediatrics is that our plan D for rescue front of neck access and emergency air, surgical airway inver, involves uh, jet ventilation. That is the primary approach for pediatrics as opposed to the um, scalpel bougie tube technique that we're going to be using for our adult population. So this is for kids, this is meant to be a rescue device uh, for oxygenation only. Uh, we have preset kits for you that will have color-coded angio casts according to the size of the child. The regulator can be dialed in to match that color code on the regulator to the cannula. And then you would insert the device and start with an IE ratio of one to four. Remember this is passive exhalation that is required. We are going to be adjusting that based on our ABGs and our clinical uh, saturations. And of course, we need to be able to get expert help uh, in order to move on to a more definitive uh, technique. I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes and focus on some subtle differences that occur for pediatrics uh, as opposed to our adult population, specifically related to uh, Plan B and Plan C. Um, one of the other things to emphasize is that oxygenation is absolutely paramount in our pediatric population. As you may all remember, hypoxemia uh, is not well tolerated and often will lead to bradycardia and eventually cardiac arrest. For this reason, it is exceedingly important very early in the algorithm when you're anticipating something uh, with a pediatric pa patient regarding airway that you call for help early. So let's focus on um, Plan B. For Plan B, there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Uh, first of all, uh, just in the as the adult population, we don't want any more than three attempts at a supraglottic airway device insertion. 
Um, but there are a couple of things that you can consider uh, that are unique to the pediatric population that may help you. If um, you're having a lot of difficulty, uh, you can consider inserting a nasopharyngeal airway um, in an effort to see if that helps with some of your oxygenation. If cricoid pressure is being uh, utilized, this would be a time to release it as well to allow that supraglottic airway device to actually sit properly. And there is a suggestion that uh, potentially you could go up a size in the supraglottic airway device that you're using if you're getting partial oxygenation and it becomes a seal issue. I also want to draw your attention to the box on the right side. Um, and it's very, very important that if you are um, able to oxygenate your patient successfully with a supraglottic airway device, you really need to stop and think whether a definitive airway is required immediately. Um, and it really does involve the use of expert health. Um, suggestions for that, of course, would be anesthesia, ENT, or the pediatric population. Um, you'll notice it does say intubate via the supraglottic airway device. However, I want you to be aware that you are not expected to intubate um, via the supraglottic airway device, that currently there aren't any pediatric bronchoscopes uh, readily available, um, but you should be aware that that may be an option that is implied uh, employed by anesthesia or ENT um, by accessing a specific pediatric scope. Um, I also want you uh, to realize um, that really your focus at that point is um, auctionating the patient and um, getting early and definitive help. With respect to Plan C, uh, there's a couple of little things as well. Um, just like our adult population, um, we want to revert back to a focus on oxygenation. And we are going to push the issue in terms of using a bag valve mass ventilation, using a two-person technique and an oral airway. Um, there are a few things, again, to consider in our PEDS population. Um, an NG tube to decompress the stomach, which may be uh, preventing us from being able to bag the patient effectively. If the child is less than two, you could insert a shoulder roll. And if you've put one in and the child is over two, really they do better with a neutral neck position, so you really shouldn't have any hyperextension. Again, releasing cricoid to try to facilitate getting oxygenation. Um, change the mask and see if you have a proper size and seal. And um, if a muscle relaxant has not been given at this point, this would be a uh, time to give this. Again, trying to obliterate the possibility of laryngospasm as a contributing factor. I want to draw your attention to the fact that that success arrow is pointing to both the orange box and the red box to try to highlight the important that if you get to plan C, which is just shy of a surgical airway and a pediatric patient, this was a pretty dire set of circumstances. That yes, you are successful in oxygenating this patient, but you are not out of the woods. You most definitely need expert help. And again, that can come in the uh, form of ENT, pediatrics, anesthesia, general surgery, ICU, and a thorough discussion around how to best proceed needs to occur. In addition, depending on what's happening, this might actually require some expert advice from McMaster or eventually criticalling this patient out. So by no means is successful oxygenation at Plan C an indication that you are out of the woods. This is a close-up of our percutaneous transtracheal jet ventilation algorithm. The which is plan D for our emergency surgical airway in our pediatric population. This is for kids that are less than 30 kilograms or under age 12. Uh, we have a pre uh, set up system for you uh, to make it a lot easier. There are cannulas, three different sizes, 13, 14, and 16. These are gonna be based on the weight of the child. Essentially, you choose the cannula, you set the regulator to the same color coding as that cannula and then you will be using the jet ventilation with an IE ratio of 1 to 4 to 1 to 5 with a target respiratory rate of 10 to 12. This is a passive recoil mechanism, so remember you have to have the upper airway open, and you're going to be looking for chest rise. You're going to adjust your frequency based on clinical condition and or ABG. You want to get all available expert help immediately, which uh, is criticaling the patient out, ENT, surgery, or anesthesia. And of course, if at any point you develop surgical emphysema, you are going to abandon this and move on for tracheostomy. 
Uh, I just want to make one major uh, comment. These are not angiocaths, okay? These are specially designed Rasmussen catheters, which I will, uh, a cannulae, which I will show you um, in the uh, training that are specifically designed for jet ventilation. These are not our old uh, angiocaths. So this is a close-up of the system that is going to be used for our surgical airway technique in our pediatric population. That's the use of transtracheal jet ventilation, and the kit is called a ManuJet 3. This is first line for our peds population as opposed to the open scalpel bougie tube technique that we're advocating in our adult population. You'll notice that there's three separate cannula in the picture. Those correspond to a 13, 14, and 16 gauge specific Rasmussen catheter. As I mentioned, not angiocaths. They are designed specifically for jet ventilation. You're going to select the largest cannula that is age appropriate for the weight. And the technique is very simpler, simple. You're going to stabilize the larynx. You're going to select your catheter, put a syringe on it, half filled with some saline. You're going to aspirate some air. That'll confirm that you're in the trachea. You're going to slide that down into the trachea. There's a lure lock on the top of that cannula. You're going to attach that to the pressure tubing and you're going to adjust the PSI um, indicator on the gauge to correspond to the same color code as the cannula that you have selected. You'll ensure there's an upper airway patency and you're going to start insufflating with an IE ratio of 1 to 4 to look for uh, chest rise and then passive exhalation and of course the Upper airway patency is important um, to allow passive exhalation from chest recoil, otherwise you're going to get barotrauma in a pneumothorax. There is a video that follows going into a bit more detail of how to actually perform this technique, and you will get an opportunity to practice this in the sim lab. The third method of emergency access through the cricothyroid membrane is cannula or needle cricothyroidotomy with jet ventilation. To do this, the surgical airway drawer is equipped with a manujet ventilator with a range of Ravusin cannulas. The manujet kit comprises the manujet ventilator, which is a modified Sanders injector. It also contains three Ravusin cannulae of different sizes. There is a 16 gauge cannula for babies, a 14 gauge cannula for young children, and a 13 gauge cannula for adults. The Ravusin cannula is a modified pre curved IV cannula with the option of oxygen attachment via a lure connection or a 15 millimeter connection. The hub also has wings for connecting a necktie to secure the cannula firmly during jetting. Although difficult to see, there are two holes 5mm from the tip which assist in keeping the cannula central in the airway during jetting. The technique for needle cannulation and jet ventilation is as follows. Step 1. Position the patient with extension of the neck. Step 2. Identify the cricothyroid membrane with the index finger and stabilize the thyroid cartilage with the non-dominant hand. Using an air or saline filled syringe, direct the catheter and syringe at 45 degrees in a coda direction to avoid the posterior tracheal wall until free flow of air is obtained. Step 4. Withdraw the needle stilette and advance the catheter to the hub. Aspirate air to reconfirm position. Attach and assemble the ventilation system. Step 5. Secure the cannula using the neck tapes or hold firmly onto it. Step 6. Ventilate using the lowest possible pressure that will allow chest excursion. If at any stage there is evidence of barotrauma, hypotension or subcutaneous emphysema, convert to surgical cricothyroidotomy. 
If reoxygenation of the patient is successful, then conversion to a formal tracheostomy using a surgical technique or to a Melker cricothyroidotomy using the Revusen cannula as a conduit for the guide wire is recommended. So in summary, our Niagara Health System Pediatric Difficult Airway Pathway incorporates the exact same approach that has been already utilized for adult population. We are still going to use our A, B, C, and D approaches. The one exception is that for D, for our surgical airway in our pediatric population, we are using first line as a jet ventilation system, using an age-appropriate cannula and PSI for oxygenation of that patient, which will be clearly marked with the kit. The jet ventilator will be located in drawer D, along with the adult emergency surgical airway equipment while all other components for the pediatric pathway will be located in the code pink cart along with the Braslow tape. So in summary, for all of our modules, we've had six modules that have gone through a number of things. The new difficult airway pathways for our adult and pediatric patient populations that have been developed specifically for the Niagara Health have taken into account the unique variability across all sites within our system. It's taken into account the usability and feasibility for non-OR settings, as well as the variability in the skill set of personnel and the lack of standardization of equipment prior to this. It is endeavored to standardize all of the equipment across all of the sites for ease of use and to make sure that it's readily available. This approach was designed to streamline the execution and critical communication between all team members when faced with a difficult airway. It's also standardized the carts and the contents across all sites for ease of use and accessibility. Simulation training will be offered to you so that you have the opportunity to practice, practice, practice all components of that pathway. In addition, your team skills and communication skills when facing this difficult situation. Additionally, laminated well. Wall posters will be available in the areas to assist with implementation and also available on our difficult airway cart. Recognition of the difficult or failed airway is, a, is key as is the communication with your team members and experts to ensure the best outcome for our patients. Some of the best advice written came from the NAP4 committee. They stated clearly, the more commonly the adopted strategy is nationally or locally agreed upon, the greater the likelihood that it will be successfully executed by the team. It is for this reason that these modules exist, as well as the offering of the simulation training to give you familiarity with equipment, the pathway, and your team building skills and communication skills, so that should you be involved in a difficult airway scenario, you will have the tools, the knowledge, and the skill set to be successful. The acknowledgements the Niagara Health Difficult Airway Committee consists of the following members Sheba Brown, Don Duvall, Melanie Hollidge, Mike Hatcher, Rafi Setrak, Madden Roy, Pete Marone, Helen Caetano, Louise Bates, John Chirico, Jill Randall, Elaine Young, and James Recroft. Our administrative assistant is Sherry Reed. The evidence is clear. Um, this Slide and the following slide can be reviewed at your leisure. Uh, this gives you some idea of some of the key elements and articles that we use to incorporate in all of our components in developing our difficult airway path. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your simulation training.